All right, just going to do a quick video on orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, and showing that this religion is not a biblical form of New Testament Christianity. It, all it is really is just the Roman Catholic pagan religion repackaged. That's all it really, when it, when it really comes down to it, it's just Roman Catholic paganism repackaged, which in turn is just Greek Roman paganism repackaged. Because Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy and, and Eastern Orthodoxy and all the other branches of Orthodoxy get their doctrine and practices from ancient Babylonian, Greek, Greco Roman, Egyptian pagan religion. It's that simple. And Hinduism and a bunch of other pagan antiquities. The Roman Catholic Church got it from Babylon, from Greece, and Rome, and the Eastern Orthodox Church just picked it up from Roman Catholicism. And I'm going to show you an uh, interesting article that has the history of Orthodoxy and showing their unscriptural pagan practices. So let's get right into this. So this is from wayoflife.org. Um, you know David Cloud's website. Of course, I don't. I do have some disagreements with David Cloud and some issues, but this article is spot on. So it says here, uh, this is the report on orthodoxy. It says orthodoxy is that branch of sacramental Christianity which broke off from the Roman Catholic Church in 1054 A.D. Until 1054, the Eastern and the Roman and the Roman were two separate branches, were two branches of the same sacramental body. The division began when the Roman Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome to Constantinople in 330 AD. Powerful church leaders claimed authority over large regions and were vying for supremacy. There was a bishop of Rome in the west and four patriarchs in the east. The main point of contention was between the eastern and the western divisions was the papacy more important than the doctrine more important than the doctrine was the issue of power and authority the eastern orthodox rejected the pope while retaining rome's sacramental system and most of rome's unscriptural doctrines uh, they, they quote down there Quote, the division of the Orthodox Church into the Western, Eastern, Roman, and Constantinople began with the division of the Roman Empire in the late 4th century AD toward the end of the 9th century, and the dialogue between the papacy and the patriarch became much sharper. It was at that time that Bulgaria was baptized, and an argument broke out between Rome and Constantinople over the patronage of the new Christian country. And in 1054, there was a formal break between the between the Western Roman and Eastern Orthodox Church when Pope Leo and Michael Cyrilius, Patriarch of Constantinople, anathematized each other. This signified a formal split. A Millennium of Russian Orthodoxy, pages 20-21. to 21. So basically, they were already part of this Roman Catholic, you know, pagan system, and they essentially just broke off and formed their own pagan religion. Which, again, just a repackaging of Greek, Greco-Roman, Egyptian, Babylonian, Hindu paganism. It's not scriptural at all, and we're going to see that later in the article. The Roman Catholic Church and its twin Eastern Orthodoxy were formed by a spiritually adulterous relationship between the political empire and apostate church leaders. The latter claimed authority over the Lord's churches and amalgamated pagan practices with New Testament truth to form an impure form of Christianity. This explains the origins of such unscriptural practices such as the, as the Mass, purgatory, sacraments, prayers to and for the dead, consecrated buildings, merry worship, scapulars, and the rosary. Eastern Orthodoxy has its roots in the same apostasy. Exactly. None of these doctrines are scriptural. They come from paganism. And I'd even add too, baptismal regeneration and infant baptism. Both those doctrines are straight out of paganism. They come from Hinduism. They come from this idea that water can wash away your sins. Is that water somehow purifies your sins. It comes from uh, Germanic Norse paganism. It comes from Hinduism. It comes from uh, the Greek Roman. You know, they have the, the, this, this well that can go down that would purify their sins. In fact, I have a book. Let me just grab this book. Back on my bookshelf. One sec. The um, Two Babylons by uh, Alexander Hislop. The book shows how the Roman Catholic Church has basically borrowed pagan uh, doctrine into their system, uh, which is they cover how the pagan origins of, uh, let's see what they got, the pagan origins of, uh, they got the pagan origins, for example, section one, they got the pagan origins of uh, baptismal regeneration. They show that the pagan origins of that uh, that baptismal regeneration is a pagan doctrine. It, it's not. It's not Christianity. It's not scriptural. It comes from pagan religions. Uh, justification by works. They show the pagan origins of that. Uh, they have um, 
Section 3, The Sacrifice of the Mass, and you know, and on and on and on and it goes in this book. Uh, it's very, very detailed, very well sourced. And they show that, that the doctrines of Rome are just pagan, you know, Greek, Roman, Hindu, Babylonian, Aztec, pagan doctrines repackaged. It's not scriptural. It's uh, apostasy. That's all it is. Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy both claim direct descent from Christ and the Apostles, but that but that this claim is bogus, but that this claim is bogus is evident in the, in their non-apostolic doctrines and practices. As a result of the split with Rome, Eastern Orthodoxy is not united under one head. There are many groupings of Orthodox, all having the same basic doctrine and practice with some minor variation. Russian Orthodox, Albanian Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, Bulgarian Orthodox, Romanian Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox, Antiochian, Antiochian Orthodox, etc. Though not united under a world headquarter, these groupings are united separately through into Episcopal councils over which a bishop rules. Also, each group is in turn in formal relationship with the Patriarch of Constantinople, who presides over all the Eastern Orthodox churches. Then you have here, uh, quote, No one patriarch is responsible for any other patriarch, yet all are within the jurisdiction of an ecumenical council of all churches in communion with the Patriarch of Constantinople, Constantinople, who holds the title of Ecumenical Patriarch, the handbook. It's a handbook they got there. From a biblical perspective, there is little difference between the, ecclesiolo the ecclesiology of Roman Catholicism and that of Eastern Orthodoxy. Both incorporate, incorporate an, an, an unscriptural form of church government uh, through which an intra-church bureaucracy rules lords over the local assembly. Exactly. You read in the scriptures, you'll have the churches, you know, all throughout the book of Acts. The churches, you know, at Antioch, the church. Actually, let me just show you a quick scripture on that. Acts chapter uh, 13. Let me just go full screen. Acts 13, verses 1 to 3. Uh, yeah, Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. Just make sure I had the right reference there. Uh, now they were they were in the church that was at Antioch. Certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, uh, Simeon, that were called Niger, and uh, Lu Lu Lucius and of Cyrene and Manan, uh, which have been brought up with the herald uh, of Tetric and Saul. And says, and, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they pray, fasted and prayed, they, and laid their hands on them. They sent them away. Not good at reading on a computer. Plus, lack of sleep doesn't really help. But that's the thing. There's the church at Antioch, and there's local autonomous churches. You see that throughout the Book of Acts. Acts again, Acts 13, verse 1 to 3 is that one example I showed you. But the system of governments, govern, governance, basically of churches that the Eastern Orthodox religion has, is no different than that of Roman Catholicism. It's unscriptural and it's heathenistic. It's pagan, essentially. But yeah, gospel and doctrine. So it says, uh, unlike Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy rejects the papacy, purgatory, and the doctrine of indulgences. Well, even a, a broken clock can tell the right time sometimes. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Uh, like Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy has a consecrated priesthood and seven sacraments, which only the priests have the authority to perform. Baptism, anointing, communion, penance, holy orders, marriage, and holy unction. This is from the Handbook of Denominations in the United States, 9th edition. Okay, what are the biblical ordinances? Let me show you the scriptures. Uh, oops, didn't go full screen there. The biblical ordinances. Hebrews chapter one or six verses one. Hebrews chapter six verses one to two. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on, to, on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, and of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgments. First, uh, First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 25. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup, when he had, su when he had supped, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, this do ye, uh, as, oft ye drink it, sorry, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. It's done in remembrance. That's simple. Luke chapter 22, uh, verse number 19. 
And he took bread, and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. It's remembrance. It's not a literal, uh, you know, re-sacrificing, or, or somehow some kind of continuation of, or some kind of re-offering of the sacrifice. That's wicked. That's pagan. That is um, cannibalism, essentially. That's what it comes down to. Read Leviticus chapter 17, verses uh, 10 to 12. Cannibalism is forbidden. It's drinking blood and, and eating flesh. It's a sin. It's forbidden. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse number 6. It's condemned there as well. Genesis, I believe it's Genesis chapter 9, verses 6, 4, Genesis chapter 9, verses 4 to 6. Make sure I have the right reference there. It's, uh, it's cannibalistic. It's cannibalistic heathen religion. It's not scriptural at all. But continuing. Uh, and also the thing of, uh, you know, uh, holy orders, holy unction, and it, it mentioned how it is by sacraments that men are saved, they are channels of grace, in contrast with the, to the New Testament ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which are simple memorials and reminders. Uh, in orthodoxy, salvation begins at baptism, which is called the new birth. So, but again, they, they basically take these ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and they, they turn them into means of grace. Just like any lost pagan would, with the heathen doctrines of baptismal regeneration and uh, the cannibalistic mass. But this is what it says about baptismal regeneration. Quote, First place among the sacraments of the Orthodox Church is the occupied by holy baptism, which, uh, by which a man who has come to believe in Christ by being immersed three times in water. Where in the Bible are they, are they immersed three times in water? You read Acts chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. The eunuch is only immersed once, not three different times. There's no, there's no three-time immersion of baptism in water. That's unscriptural. The baptism, you read Romans chapter 6, baptism, it's it's symbolic of you being dead to Christ and you know the new man being born. It's, it's It happens once. Because why? Christ died once. Let me show you a scripture on that, actually. And this, this refutes the whole Catholic Mass as well. Because here's the thing, if we have to continually re-offer Jesus Christ, then I guess we have to be, then we have to be continually re-baptized as well, essentially. Let me show you that from this, ver this scripture here. Um, where is it? Here it is. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, should also, we also should walk in newness of life. So it's symbolic of you being dead to Christ and a new man being born, the old man dying. Uh, then you go down to um, verses 9 to 10, Romans chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, and it shows that basically if if basically Christ had to be continually re-sacrificed, then we would have to be continually re-baptized to sim symbolize that, essentially. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no dominion over him. For that, for in that he died, he for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. If he had to continually die to sin, then we'd have to be continually baptized, rebaptized over and over and over again because it's symbolic. But the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church have set aside the commandments of God for their heathen man-made traditions. But they basically, I'll keep reading what it says here in that thing. On that, uh, what is it? It says, uh, so being immersed three times in water in the name of the Father, the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whole other issue there. The Trinity is not scriptural at all. The Trinity is a pagan doctrine. The biblical Godhead is body, soul, and spirit. Jesus Christ is the body, the Father is the soul, the Holy Ghost is the spirit. I have other videos on that if you want to see some scriptures proving that. But the Trinity is occultic, it's witchcraft, it's paganism. It's not the scriptural Godhead of body, soul, and spirit. And by the way, no, I'm not oneness too. Oneness is also a heresy. Modalism is also a very wicked heresy. So don't try to pin me with that crowd either. Uh, the Godhead is not oneness and it's not Trinitarianism. Both sides are wrong. Uh, so it says it's cleansed through the to, so it says that uh, immersed three times in water is cleansed through the divine grace of all sins, original sin and personal sins, and is reborn into a new a new holy spiritual life. This baptism serves as a door through which man enters into the house of eternal wisdom, the church. For without it, man cannot be united completely with the Savior and become a member of His church, receive the order of the sac receive the other sacraments, and be be the heir to eternal life. This is from these truths we hold. The Holy Orthodox Church, her life's and teachings, St. Uh, Tictons, Monastery, copyright 1986, by, and, and they get the source down there. I'll let, don't, 
like I said, like I might have said earlier, I will link this in the description. So, and then they mention how uh, uh, baptism is new birth, being born to the life made new by our by our Lord Jesus Christ. It means to be alive in Christ through the holy baptism. We all become all become Christ. And that's from one church, Russian Orthodox Church, 1981. So that they believe in baptismal regeneration. Then they have the holy chris, chrism, chrismation, uh, which is, you know, again, I'll link this in the description. You can read it yourself, but I'm not going to read this whole thing. But here's the thing. Salvation continues then with the participation of the Holy Communion or the Holy Eucharist, whereby Christ is supposedly sacrificed anew, and the bread and the wine of the Eucharist becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. This is the Orthodox form of the Catholic Mass. Exactly. And then they quote uh, the sources down there, uh, which, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll be linking it in the description. You can read it yourself. Of uh, these truths we hold, the Holy Orthodox Church, her life and teachings, they quote the same thing there. Uh, then they, of course, they venerate Mary as the, quote, ever-virgin mother of God, which is, you know, a, a false doctrine. Mary was not the uh, mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus Christ, but she was not the ever-virgin. She had other children after Jesus Christ. Psalms uh, chapter Psalms chapter 89, not chapter, sorry, Psalms 89 versus, uh, let me just make sure I have the right reference, actually. I just want to, you know, because when I quote off, my quote by memory, I, I often get the wrong reference. But Psalms chapter, I keep saying chapter, Psalms 89 verses, uh, yeah, Psalms 89 verses 8 to 9, or sorry, Psalms 69, my apologies, verses 8 to 9. See, this is what lack of sleep does to me, it messes me up. Uh, Psalms 89, sorry, sorry, Psalms 69 verses 8 to 9. Keep getting it mixed up there. See, I'm still fallible. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Psalms 69 verses 8 to 9. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Okay, my mother's children. David is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, David will, will you know, speak, you know, in prophetically to Jesus Christ. He'll speak in prophetically referring to Jesus Christ. But Mary had other children after Jesus Christ. So more scriptural proof on that. Matthew, chapter, chapter, uh, where is it? Chapter 12, I think it is. If I'm not mistaken. Matthew chapter 12. Yeah, here it is. Matthew chapter 12, verse uh, 46 to 47. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with them. The one said unto him, Behold, but thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. So he had a brethren there. I think it's Matthew chapter 13, verse uh, 50. 53 to 55 and it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these these parables he departed thence and when he was come into his own country he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were that they were astonished and said whence hath this man whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works is this not the carpenter's son is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas are in, and verse 56 and his sisters are they not all with us whence forth or whence then hath this man all these things so he had four, so Mary had at least four children and at least two daughters because you have sisters plural so that, that would indicate at least two so he, she said she had at least six other children after Jesus Christ further proof that Mary was not a, a virgin her whole life she was not the ever virgin Matthew chapter 1 verse 25 Actually, I'll start at verse 24. Matthew chapter 1, verse 24 to 25. Let me just make sure I'm full screen. Yeah. Then Joseph being, Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, until, until she had brought forth, forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Okay, two things here. Notice how it says her firstborn son. Um, there's no reason to call Jesus her firstborn son if she only had one child. You just call her her only born child, not her firstborn. Firstborn would say there are, there was a second born, a third born, a fourth born. You know, Jesus was not her only child. She had other children after Jesus Christ. And no cause says there. It says, uh, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Oftentimes in the Bible, you know, when it says knew them or knew them in that kind of context, it's referring to, you know, sexual relationships. 
in the marriage. So Joseph uh, took her as a wife and knew her after she brought forth her firstborn son. That right there destroys the whole Catholic, you know, Orthodox lie of the perpetual virginity of Mary. She had other children, and Jesus was her firstborn son, and Joseph knew her after that happened, and took her took her as her, as his wife. Plus, not to mention too how First Timothy chapter four verses one to three shows that you know this kind of forced celibacy is a doctrine of devils, like abstaining, you know, forbidding to marry is a doctrine of devils. Again, that's First Timothy chapter four verses one to three. It's that simple. Orthodoxy is not biblical. Christianity in any sense of the word, but they write this about how she how they venerate Mary as the ever virgin mother of God Quote in the theology and piety of the Orthodox Church a special place of honor is given to the mother of God the most holy Theo Theotokos hope I'm saying that word right and ever virgin Mary who is reverenced by the Orthodox as being more honorable than the cherubim and more glorious uh, chapter and verse on that please and, and, and then, then they claim they don't worship her Oh, she's more, she's more honorable than the cherubims. Yeah, that's called worship. Plain and simple. More glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. If Mary is honored as uh, Theotokos, she too is so, is too. She is honored because she is the pragma, all holy. Thus Mary is seen by the church as the new Eve, and Christ is the new Adam, whose perfect obedience is contrasted with the, with the perfect with the disobedience of the first mother Eve, in paradise. Then they quote Saint Irenaeus, who really holds no authority in you know, whatever. I mean, you know, he he had some interesting stuff. Saint I, uh, Irenaeus, I think is what, he, what his name is, but uh, Scripture is your final standard. But they have um, this is from these truths we hold: the Holy Orthodox Church, her life and teachings, uh, Saint uh, Tictons. Tikhon's monastery. Again, hope I'm saying the words right. So they got prayers offered for the dead, which is, of course, necromancy. Let me show you the scripture on that. Make sure I have the right reference. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. There's two. There's actually another scripture too that shows, you know, that praying to the dead people is a sin. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Uh, where is it? Verses 10 to 12. There shall not be found among you any found among you any that maketh a son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee now it's interesting too because you read in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28 verses 11 to 16 Samuel calls up or sorry Saul calls up Samuel he calls up a dead you know Old Testament saint and it's seen as witchcraft you know him calling up a dead saint like that it's interesting and, and the scripture I wanted to point out too is uh, because you have of course the verse in first Samuel chapter 6 or first Samuel chapter 28 verse 11 to 16 where sent where Saul is busy doing witchcraft by calling up a dead saint Samuel uh, from the Abraham's bosom but there's another really interesting scripture I uh, should bring out too that shows that you're not supposed to pray to dead saints. It's uh, necromancy. That's all it is. Yeah, First Kings chapter, or sorry, Second Kings chapter two, verses nine to ten. Second Kings chapter two, verses nine to ten. Let me make sure, make sure I got the right reference. Yeah. Second Kings chapter two, verses nine to ten. When it came to pass. Uh, when they were gone over, that, Eli that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, uh, before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. Notice how in verse 9, Elijah was saying, Hey, if you want to ask me something, ask me while I'm still alive asking me before I'm taken up to heaven. What does that show? You pray to a saint, you ask them for help. You, you know, Obviously, you shouldn't be praying to anybody but God, but just, you know, hear what I'm saying. You don't ask a saint for help while they're not alive. Basically, Elijah was saying, hey, ask me for help while I'm still alive. Don't ask me when I'm, I'm called up to heaven, when God takes me up to heaven. You don't ask a saint for help when they're already dead. That is necromancy. Elijah shows right here that you ask him while he's still alive. You don't ask him while he's dead. 
So Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy are just, they're guilty of the sin of necromancy. It's that simple. But back to the article. So they, they pray for the dead, obviously. Um, so it says, prayers are offered for the dead who are who also are believed to pray for those on earth. Well, again, 2 Kings chapter uh, 2, verses 9 to 10 debunks all of that. Uh, it says, quote, at every divine service, the Holy Orthodox Church offers up prayers for her departed children. Uh, it, get the source right there. Uh, quote, but the soul of the deceased are aided by the prayers of the church and of all those who knew and loved him, and also by the acts of charity carried out for his sake by doing good works for the sake of those who are dead. We are, as it were, completing what they left undone, praying, paying their debts and offering their own sacrifice to the merciful Lord on their behalf. And of course, they go about how there's tradition, which is you know above the authority of scripture. Uh, it's just showing that, sorry about that, alarm went off there. But it's just showing that the Orthodox religion is not a biblical form of Christianity. It's just the Babylonian religion that is, you know, described in this book right here, but also this book, the Holy Bible, Jeremiah chapter 44, Jeremiah chapter uh, 7, other scriptures too. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 16 talks about that. You know, that's, that's who they worship, essentially. That's the god they. That's the goddess they worship. Mary and have their pagan gods. You know, Zeus became God the Father, and you can again just read the two Babylons and also read the Bible to find the origins of the Roman Catholic goddess. She, the Virgin Mary, that the Greek Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox worship, is Diana of the Ephesians in Acts chapter nineteen, verses twenty-four to thirty-five. She is the Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah chapter 44 verses 17 to 25 and there's other examples too of her appearing in scripture she is not a new you know goddess to the Roman Catholic Church and to the Eastern Orthodox and they'll say oh we don't worship her as a goddess yes they do the way they just have this admiration for her and this complete veneration for her they do worship her plain and simple and you read Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 15 15 to 19 you're not supposed to pray to the hosts of heaven you're not supposed to make images to the hosts of heaven so to, so to all your statues of, of Mary, it's a sin to make those statues. You're making statues to the host of heaven. It's a sin. Plain and simple. I could just go on and on and on about so many scriptures that just totally destroy and show this Eastern Orthodox system to be the Roman Catholic heathen system that it is. But the bottom line is, is that Eastern Orthodoxy is not a biblical form of Christianity. It is apostate paganism. And it's just Roman Catholicism repackaged. So don't be deceived by it. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.